Good evening. I woke you up. <laughs> My name is Sister Kathleen Duffy. I'm professor of physics here at Chestnut Hill College and also the director of the Institute for Religion and Science. Tonight we're joined by our president. Um, we have a lot of distinguished guests tonight. Our president, Sister Carol Jean Vale, our um, vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Uh, Steve Guerrero, Guerrero, looks, pardon me, Guerrero, I know how to say that. And the, de and the dean of the School of Undergraduate uh, Studies, Sister Cecilia Cavanaugh, as well as several faculty. So it's, it's great that, to have you all here. And we also have with us this evening several members of the Institute's Advisory Committee. Um, Ed Devinney, Dr. Ed Devinney, who you might remember from last year, he gave a talk. Peter Dodson, the same with Peter, gave a great talk last year. Uh, Frank Hoffman from Westchester University, and uh, Frank Pennington from the uh, UCC, United Church of Christ. And so in their name, and in the name of you know, all of our administrators and uh, also the advisory committee, I would like to welcome you to the Sugarloaf campus of Chestnut Hill College and to the first lecture of this, um, this uh, fall's institute, or this, the institute's fall 2012 series. As many of you know, the institute is dedicated to nurturing the constructive engagement of religion and spirituality and science and technology, and endeavors to promote a dialogue that is interfaith, multi-science, and civil. Thanks, thanks to the generous, yes, that's very difficult, isn't it? If we, if we succeed, I think we will feel good about that. But thanks to the generous support of Chestnut Hill College and the Metanexus Institute, to the endless hours and the great ideas of our expert advisory committee and to the dedication and expertise of our technical assistant, Andrea Wenzel, who's now taping this uh, lecture, we're ready to begin our second year. We have a wonderful slate of lectures and events scheduled for you and hope that you will return for more. In case you were not yet on our mailing list, you can sign up at, at, at the back table as you go out. Please do that. Um, you can also visit us on Facebook. We're really getting into the, the, the uh, new world here. Um, uh, what else? We're also thinking about beginning a blog. We have the beginnings of a blog, so keep your eyes open for that, too. Uh, you'll find information about our events on our website, and the website is www.irands. So Institute, Religion, and Science, I-R-A-N-D-S, dot org. Um, and on November 5th, we're, we're having Dr. Nathan Sivin, one of our neighbors. Uh, he's from the University of Pennsylvania. He'll speak to us about science and religion in China. And on November 26th, we will show the film Journey of the Universe, and for respondents, we'll have those who helped to make that film, uh, Mary uh, Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm of Yale University. And then next semester, we hope to have lectures by Andy Newberg from Thomas Jefferson Hospital, Ted Davis from Messiah College, uh, Father John Stoudemire, Jesuit from uh, the University of Detroit Mercy, and Rabbi Nancy Fuchs Kramer from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. Uh, this semester, our reading circle will discuss Ilya Delio's The Emerging Christ, in case you would like to join us. Uh, we also house a, a special collection, over 300 books on science and religion, in our library on the main campus. And it, soon, we're going to post an interactive list that, um, that you could you know, use and see if there's anything there that would be helpful for you. So that's, that's what we can tell you about the Institute and what's coming up in the future. But this evening, we're truly blessed to have with us a woman who truly embodies in a spectacular way what we hope to do in the Institute. Dr. Celia Dean Drummond is both a scientist and a theologian. As professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame, she holds a joint appointment in the Department of Theology and the College of Science. 
However, during this academic year, Celia is working at the Center of a Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey, participating in a, as a senior fellow in a project on human nature and evolution. Dr. Dean Drummond graduated in the natural sciences from Cambridge University, obtained a doctorate in plant physiology at Reading University, and received postdoctoral fellowships from the University of British Columbia and Cambridge University before taking up a lectureship in plant physiology at Durham University. After a successful career in the biological sciences, she, just, she obtained an honors degree in theology and then a doctorate in systematic theology from Manchester University. From 2000, the year 2000 to 2011, she held a, professor, a professorial chair in theology in the biological sciences at the University of Chester and was director of its Center for Religion and Biosciences. Finally, in 2011, she came to the United States and took up her present position at the University of Notre Dame, Indiana. During her scientific career, Celia lectured both nationally and internationally and published over 30 scientific articles. Now, after switching to theology, her research focuses on the engagement of systematic theology in the biological sciences on areas relating theology and theological ethics with aspects of the biosciences, as well as on practical ethical issues in bioethics and environmental ethics. Mm -hmm. Celia has published 22 books, 33 contributions to books, and, and 43 articles in areas relating to theology or ethics. Some of her more recent books include Creation Through Wisdom, Genetics and Christian Ethics, Ecotheology, Christ and Evolution, Wonder and Wisdom, Creaturely Theology on God, Humans, and Other Animals, Seeds of Hope, Facing the Challenge of Climate Justice, Religion, and Ecology in the Public Sphere. And the latest, I think, is Joining in the Dance, Catholic Social Theology and Ecology. And I skipped a whole lot of them. <laughs> Celia has held many prominent positions in her field. In May 2011, she was elected chair of the European Forum for the Study of Religion and Environment. She has served as editor of the International Journal Ecotheology and on the spirituality team at the Catholic Fund for Overseas Development, working explicitly in the area of environmental justice and climate change. And um, she is an editor of a new, uh, an upcoming uh, 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 a journal also, uh, I didn't get quite the, the, um, the title, but philosophy and, anyway. In 2011, she was elected fellow of the Ec Institute for Global Health at the University of Notre Dame. Tonight, Celia will speak to us on Christ and, e and Ecology, Deep Incarnation. So please join me in welcoming Celia to Chestnut Hill College and to our institute gathering. Thank you very much for the, the really generous introduction. Um, I think I'll move, whoops. Sorry. Okay, um, can you all hear? It's a, um, it's a great privilege and an honor for me to, to be among you and have all the various distinguished guests here today. Um, and I sometimes don't recognize myself when, when my own CV is read out and wonder how on earth have I managed to do that. But uh, but I assure you that I am a normal human being <laughs> and that I do enjoy my work. And I also have um, a husband and two children, which are the light of my life. So, but tonight I'm going to be talking about deep incarnation and its relationship to ecology. Um, and I'm going to focus in more on the theological side rather than the ecological side. But I hope those of you who are biologists among you will if you like, ask questions at the end and help sort of draw out some aspects of that um, in order to, that we can engage in this more together. But before we begin, I'm going to um, run you through the themes of today. First of all, I'm sure some of you are wondering, what on earth is deep incarnation? 
And I should tell you that I took the term originally from uh, a, th a friend and th a theologian called uh, Niels Gregersen, who uh, works in Denmark. And he started using the term deep incarnation when, in talking about evolutionary issues and the relevance or the significance of Christ for evolution, rather in the manner of Teilhard de Chardin, who we've uh, heard about on several occasions. Today I'm going to treat it slightly differently, but it has a similar sort of resonance. Then um, I'm going to talk about it in terms of the word made flesh and what that might mean. But I'm going to start translating that more in a historical key on word and deed. And in order to do that, I'm going to use the work of Hans Urs von Balthasar, um, who I've become particularly interested in recently, um, on his, uh, his idea of theodrama. And then I'm, that's when I start weaving in the ecology. Um, so you have to be patient, those biologists who are wondering, when, when are we going to get to the ecological part? But I assure you it's all relevant. And then finally, humanity in the drama. Where do we put ourselves? And that, that's something I'm thinking more about this year in relation to huma, human nature, uh, evolution, and other animals, which is the title of my uh, project this year. But of course, you can stretch it to not just other animals, but the whole of the natural world as well. But we have to take one step at a time um, in theology. So first of all, what is deep incarnation? And uh, in order to, t to start to clarify this, I'm going to contrast deep incarnation with a general sense of God's presence or imminence in all that is. And I do this for a number of reasons. First of all, because I think that incarnation is premised on consideration of Christ or Christology, whereas God's presence is um, premised on understanding belief in God as creator. So while the understanding of God's presence in all this is comes from our understanding of the creator God, an understanding of deep incarnation follows from our understanding of who Christ is and Christ's significance. And you might think, well, so what? Well, actually, it is pretty important because the relationship, the looking at the relationship between these two avoids two uh, different tendencies that happen in certainly in science and religion, and certainly in, um, especially in, in science and religion when it engages with um, ecology. One tendency is called Christomonism, that is a focus on Christ to the exclusion of other branches of systematic theology. And the other tendency is pantheism, where we identify God with all that is. Now, by putting these two together, I would say that it avoids both those two possible tendencies. But at the same time, both um, Christ and, and or God in nature is problematic if we see it in an exclusive sense, an exclusive sense both in relation to, to human, only human beings or only in relation to either one or the other. So what I'm trying to do is an expansive version of what that might mean by linking up deep incarnation with theodrama. If you don't know what I mean by theodrama quite yet, just hold off for a moment because we'll be coming back to that and I'll like, explain a little more what that, what, what, where that term comes from and why it's important. Well, we have to go back to the basics first. And the, the basics is, whoops, the word becomes flesh. So I'm grounding an understanding of deep incarnation in the Gospel of John. Logos becomes sarx, that is, the word becomes flesh. But then in John, in the sarx, in the flesh, we see divine doxa, or glory. And behind this wisdom language of the word becoming flesh, we find um, examples of Sophia. Sophia, as it were, is hidden from view. But Sophia is standing in for logos, as it were, in the background. So when John uses the word, in the, in, the, in the word we see divine doxa and the word becoming flesh, he has in his mind Sophia or wisdom. So the wisdom language, as it were, is behind what we, what we see. And many people, in recognizing this, and it's, uh, and it's something that we'll 
I will elaborate a little bit further later, but in recognizing this, they see, well, maybe there are cosmological themes at play here. Perhaps this is a metaphysical or co cosmology that comes from the Stoics in the back of John's mind. Certainly, we do find these kinds of themes. In the beginning, creation, light, darkness, all in the prologue of the Gospel of John. And this is one uh, line of evidence that accounts for a cosmological interest in the Gospel of John. And it's something that Niels Gregerson has focused in on um, in himself in some of the articles he's done on deep incarnation. But I'd like to point out there's another strand, too, that very often uh, gets forgotten and one that, um, that I think that we need to pay attention to. And that is the Hebraic emphasis on God in history is there as well in the, in the um, prologue. So the action of God in history comes out in the words used, such as the tabernacle, glory, or enduring love. So we have a, a richer interwoven account of cosmology, but also the action of God in history. And in order to tease out this um, process a little more, I want us to look at uh, the relationship between word and deed. So word, the word of the Lord, what does that really mean when we talk about the word, the word becoming flesh? What is at the background when scholars are thinking about what the, what the word is? And in Hebraic thought, we find that the word is often associated with deed. So um, the word of the Lord, logos, or logos kyrio, which is the Greek, is a, a dynamic interrelationship of both word and deed coming together in Hosea 1.1 1, 1 and Joel 1.1. 1, 1. At the same time, the word is life-giving, and the word is also healing. And these are some of the texts that um, I refer to. Uh, to give you examples of that, I won't read them out. Um, but at the same time, the word is illumination. So the word is life-giving, healing, and creative, um, and illuminating. And we can ask ourselves, um, what then uh, does this mean about the, the word um, uh, uh, the, the word and deed in, in the prologue. What might, it, what might it mean in this context? And uh, one, of the, uh, one, one of the, if you like, the teasing out of this particular analysis suggests is that it's, it's not enough simply to think of deep incarnation being stoic or being re a, a result of stoic cosmology. There's also something else going on here as well, which has to do with action, with deed, um, uh, and with uh, a movement, as it were. And so it becomes a, a way of, if you like, uniting the universal with the particular, the universal in the cosmological strand, but also the particular in the more Hebraic emphasis on particular um, instances of, of, of deed, the Lord, uh, the, the word and, and deed. But let's look at the relationship between word and Sophia in more detail, because this is another possible way of uniting the universal and particular, which I haven't really dealt with sufficiently so far. And the, these are the number of parallels between Sophia and Jesus Sophia. So what I'm saying now is that there are examples in the, in the scriptures in the Hebrew Bible, such as Sirah 24.8, which refers to the Sophia being sent into the world. And that's exactly the way Jesus is spoken about in the prologue. So the logos, or the word, being sent into the world is in parallel with Sophia being sent into the world. And these parallels are not just um, accidental. They seem to happen again and again and again. Sophia delights in family. Jesus, Sophia, lives among us, if John 1, 14. Sophia abides in the created world. Again, the Logos is, is integral to the created world, referring to who Christ is. Sophia is also uh, the cause of division and rejection, showing some parallels, again, with Jesus, Sophia. And I'm calling it Jesus, Sophia, as a reminder that really there's a, there's a parallel, really, between 
who Christ is and, uh, and the Sophia language. And Sophia appeared on earth and lived um, with humankind, uh, Barak 3, 37-38. And this is the crucial difference. In Jesus' Sophia, Jesus became human flesh. So Jesus didn't just appear on earth and live with humankind. Jesus actually became human flesh. And that crucial difference suggests not only that the... Um, that Christ is the Word made flesh, but also Christ is uh, the wisdom, the incarnate wisdom of God. So, so God, Christ, Jesus is the in, incarnate Word, and Jesus is the incarnate wisdom. I'm not the first person who's noticed the significance of Sophia for Christology, and to pretend to um, do so would be facetious on my part. Um, Sergei Bulgakov is an orthodox theologian who in the last century developed his um, understanding of the Lamb of God incidentally around the same kind of time that Teilhard de Chardin was writing his uh, particular uh, books um, on, the, on the topic of, of uh, the human phenomenon um, so and both scholars I would say have important significance for what we're trying to do today. But Bulgakov has, I think, been neglected um, rather more than, than Teilhard de Chardin has. Um, and his, he is interesting because he situated himself, as it were, between the West and the East in the manner that Teilhard de Chardin could also be said to have situated himself some, in the, on that boundary between the East and the West. But Bulgakov was coming from an Eastern Orthodox position, but he worked in Paris, whereas Teilhard was uh, um, uh, Western, coming from the Western tradition, but then spent a large chunk of his life in China, and so imbibed some of the Eastern ideas and other Eastern Orthodox ideas. Um, and I, I would say that his understanding of the, the Lamb of God is helpful in trying to combine the universal with, partic with the particular in the manner that Sophia does or seems to do in the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is one of his main inspirations for this book um, on the Lamb of God, which uh, fortunately for us has been translated into English a few years ago, so we don't have to read the original Russian. But I think the, it's, it's helpful to, to, while it's helpful to focus in on the image of the Lamb of God in Bulgakov, it's still highly speculative. In other words, while I'm fascinated with Bulgakov's writing, and I think he's, he's a pioneer in shaping or in trying to reshape the whole of the theological exercise, enterprise in sophiological language, it is very, very speculative. And it, I wonder, or I have started to wonder, whether he really has taken seriously enough, what you might call Hebrew wisdom. The Hebrew wisdom that is grounded, that is rooted in the particular, that is, if you like, co made concrete in the life of the everyday life and in the, in the life of the family and so on. And so um, rather than dwell on, uh, on Bulgakov's particular interpretation of um, the Lamb of God, what I'm going to do now is go back to the... Um, to the, what I call the drama of deep incarnation. And uh, for this, we need to think of us, think of, put ourselves into the shoes of John, even though that's it's quite problematic uh, because we can never really fathom the, the full depths of his own theological insights. But what we can realize or recognize is that John reflected or wrote his gospel many years um, after the, the life death and resurrection of Christ. So it was a re result of many years of fruitful um, reflection and exploration. And it is the most mature um, gospel theologically compared to the other gospels uh, of Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke. And he wrote these words in the light of the dramatic events of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So we cannot understand, or I, I, I'm going to try and argue with you today, that um, we cannot understand what the prologue means, which speaks about the incarnation, that speaks about the word made flesh, unless we understand it as in the light of the death, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in fact, the prologue is a summary of that life, death, and resurrection as well. 
which reinforces the point that what he's trying to tell you in summary form is a distillation of the reflection on the dramatic life, death, and resurrection of Christ. So the passion of Christ and the passion narrative is crucial. And um, in as much as, uh, as the incarnation, as it were, identifies with our mortal flesh, it's also about entering into suffering flesh. Um, entering, identify, identifying with our mortality and our fragileness. So God identifies with creaturely mortality in the incarnation. And this is one of the meanings or interpretations of deep incarnation that I want to present to you today. It's a particular history, the history of Jesus Christ, but it's also a very profound history because it goes to the depth of who we are as fragile human beings and goes to the depth of all created flesh, not just human flesh. So in this sense, Christ stands for suffering and dying creatures. The question then becomes, how? How might um, Christ in some sense stand uh, for all of us? One possible way of um, meditating on this comes from thinking of Christ as, um, or humanity, as a microcosm. So Christ, in a sense, is a, a microcosm, rather like the ancient um, idea of humanity as a microcosm. And so humanity, then, is standing in for the processes of the earth. So we get generate in this um, thought anthropological cosmology, but also cosmological anthropology. Humanity, as it were, takes up and includes the cosmos. At the same time, the cosmos also expresses humanity. And I would say that the, the, book, uh, the first uh, chapter of the, of the letter of, of Colossians expresses this idea. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful hymn to wisdom, but it also speaks of Christ being both there at the creation of the world, but also the world being redeemed through Christ. But it's in wisdom language. But what's very different is that rather than just adopting the wisdom language and the wisdom hymn, the author of the book of, of the letter of, of Colossians, the epistle of Colossians, introduces the blood of the cross. So just as um, the word, uh, when, when we're speaking about a uh, Sophia language, the difference is, that Jesus, Sophia, becomes flesh, which is different from how the, um, the, the Hebrew scriptures understands the role of wisdom. So here, um, wisdom is reinterpreted through the blood of Christ. So it qualifies what I would call the cosmological and liturgical hymn to wisdom. And if we begin with the cross, we are probably less likely to go into a kind of speculative ontology that is always lurking in the background if we just focus in on wisdom um, and on cosmology to the exclusion of, of what I call practical realities. But then we have to say to ourselves, how can we read um, our history or read Christ's history in the light of this universal significance? We need to try and probe this a little bit more. Yes, this um, epistle of Colossians speaks of the immense cosmological importance of Christ, but how do we um, read uh, the particular history of Christ in the light of this universal significance? And here I'm going to um, wheel in um, Hans Urs von Balthasar on, on his understanding of theodrama. For Balthasar, the central act in the theodrama is the God's action in history in the passion narrative of Christ. Drama invites participation by all of us. We cannot be simply external observers in the way that we might be able to be if we were just watching a narrative or seeing a, what some people call a grand narrative unfold. Theodrama invites us in. It insists that we position ourselves, as it were, in the process, in the drama. And it's, um, it's weary of what might be called false objectification, the attempt, as it were, to stand outside and, and pretend that we can be outside observers. 
And what I like about uh, theodrama in particular is that it mediates or seeks to mediate between history and more ontological approaches to Christology. And if we look at what um, Hansos von Balthasar says about the cross, this is what he, he claims. God's entire world drama hinges on this scene. This that is the scene of the cross. This is the theodrama into which the world and God have their ultimate input. Here, absolute freedom enters into created freedom, interacts with created freedom, and acts as created freedom. This is a profound mystery that even von Balthasar in all his uh, writing cannot fully fathom. But at the same time, the theodrama is then the revelation of the Trinity. It's the revelation of self-giving love of God for the world, which is at the heart of the theodrama. And it's also the heart of the deep incarnation. So if we're going to understand deep incarnation of, or the word made flesh, then we have to meditate on the self-giving love of God, which is at the heart of theodramatics. So deep incarnation means deep into the fragile, suffering, and mortal flesh, but it also reveals the depth of the love of God for the world. And Balthasar um, says this further on the cross as well. It is the drama of the emptying of the Father's heart in the generation of the Son that contains and surpasses all possible drama between God and the world. So this is the ultimate drama, as it were, to which all other dramas pale into insignificance. But at the same time, we somehow are invited in to participate, as it were, into what is going on in this process. Of course, fortunately for us, um, the, the cross is not necessary for Trinitarian relationships. So it's not as if, and I have written a critical article on von Balthasar um, in this respect, in that I think uh, he sometimes gives the, imaging, the image of God as a kind of punishing God. And I think we need to get away from any sense that this is, if you like, um, something that God intends. But at the same time, we must see this movement as a movement of, of deep love for the world and not, if you like, try and escape from the suffering that is part of this theodramatic action. But suffering is not the end of the story. The theodrama doesn't end with a cross. It ends with the, or the, the, the cross, if you like. Then three days later, we have the, the, the dramatic events of the resurrection. But before we get to the resurrection, Balthasar encourages us to meditate more deeply on, uh, at the, on Holy Saturday. Here, and this is probably one of the most original aspects of his theological corpus, where he understands Christ as sinking into the world of the dead. In solidarity with those who are dying or even face death. So here the fear of death is challenged. So it's not just mortality that we come uh, to embrace, but the fear of death is part of what um, deep incarnation means. So the depth of existential identification with human beings includes this fear of death, which is unique, I suggest, to human beings. So part of that uh, process of, of deep incarnation is one of complete identification, not just with the dying process and our mortality, but also the fear of dying and the fear of what lies beyond death. But this is a shared experience with other creatures in that other creatures are also facing their, uh, facing their deaths, but not in a self-conscious way, that, um, that is in the way that is true for, for human beings. But the significance of this dying is broader than simply that for, huma, for humanity. And this is where we... Um, come to an understanding of, of deep incarnation as pneumatology or as part of the life of the spirit because it's part of a, a woven history of entanglement. And this is where I start to, um, if you like, depart from Balthasar more significantly than just being critical of his own particular image of God uh, in relation to Christ on the cross because Balthasar um, doesn't take uh, sufficient notice of ecological 
relationships in, in coming up with his image of theodrama. For him, it's only human beings that are part of the theodrama and not other creaturely kinds. But it doesn't take too much um, imagination to suggest that we can expand theodramatics and include other ecological relationships and other um, ecological beings in that um, expansion. Of course, uh, Balthasar never intended his um, theodramatics to morph into a grand narrative because that was the very uh, basis on which he wrote his theodrama. But I think a, a greater stress on inclusivity and improvisation on the part of God's action in the theodrama counts against um, this tendency to become um, a grand narrative that's somehow detached from creaturely reality. And this is where I'm going to bring in contemporary ecological philosophy. Because for many, many years, and I think it's true of, um, uh, of those who've worked in the area of e environmental ethics, as well as in the area of religion and ecology, for many years, um, a focus on equilibrium has been stressed to the exclusion of what you might call dynamic flux, which is really where um, ecologists are at when it comes to understanding how ecological systems work. So the equilibrium is a fragile equilibrium. It's not a, like a fixed and balanced state of nature, which we tend to think, where we, often we, in, from the popular mind at least, we tend to think of ecology as being a kind of fixed and balanced state of nature. But actually, um, ecologists have found that this, isn't the, this does not match the reality of the situation. The situation is more, more fragile, more fluid. Now humans are not so much observers to this ecological uh, dynamics, but part of it. So we enter into that ecological reality. We become, as it were, um, woven in um, with each other. Creatures make their own worlds, and this is something which uh, it, um, evolutionary biologists are only just beginning to emphasize. This need to see the, uh, the natural world or the environment not just as a static and passive force against which natural selection works, but actually human beings and other creatures are agents creating their own worlds and constructing their own niches. I would say this has some analogy with the idea of theodrama. We're not simply passive recipients of our fate, but we are actively involved in the theodramatics of which we've become included. The wild nature myth, as it were, tends to put forward the view that, that nature is there and completely untouched by human beings. But this isn't, isn't true to reality. The reality is that but the whole planet has been marked by human influences. And the whole planet, as it were, is in interrelationship with humans in, in our human ecology, in dynamic relationship with the other ecologies in which we find ourselves. But then we have to say, how then can we start to um, include... Uh, the, these are um, coral reefs... Um, how can we include the rich diversity and the beauty and the um, awesomeness of the natural world in which we find ourselves placed? Can we start to imagine that this is also part of the dramatic story in which we play a role ourselves? What about these other creaturely kinds who give us um, pause for thought, especially those primates that are so close to our own sense of who we are? When we look at in the, into the face of an orangutan, do we see something of ourselves or not? How are we to understand the lives of these other creatures in their ecological denseness and richness in, the, in relation to our own understanding of what it is uh, to be human? So um, deep incarnation then is a transformative and dramatic movement of God in Christ that includes other creaturely kind. So it's not a spatial descent of God into creation, nor is it simply an extension of Christ into creation. It's something else entirely in the way I'm understanding it. It's one which invites us all to take part 
and challenges us to situate ourselves in relation to the dramatic events of the, uh, of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And deep incarnation is also inclusive of pneumatology or the Holy Spirit's work because in order to take our place, as it were, in this dramatic movement, we have to, uh, we need to think of where the Holy Spirit is in that particular process. And for that, I'm going to come back now to um, a presence, a, a, an action. Um, first of all, deep incarnation means more than divine presence, where Christ is view, as, viewed as emergent. And I'm saying this because one um, interpretation of Christology is that just as uh, human beings emerged in the evolutionary process, according to some scientists at least, so Christ is, if you like, another exemplar of a higher form of human, perhaps. Um, and this is the, uh, the understanding of Christ as a kind of emergent divine. I would say that deep incarnation challenges that particular view um, and, and suggests something more radical, something more dramatic, something where, if you like, what happened was not something that we necessarily could expect or predict. So Christology then has transcendent significance, even if it begins with history. God as creator, as it, as it were, is still there, though. God hasn't abandoned um, the creation. So the divine presence is there, hovering, as it were, in the creative process. But now we have Christ as deep incarnation, committed fully to the, uh, the material world and identifying with um, the, the mortal fragility of our own human lives. The divine presence then accompanies creation, and this is um, what you might call uh, creation theology. But theodrama is at the boundary of creation and new creation. It's where things start to shift. It's the, the community of, of creatures form a site then for sacramental presence, but this presence is renewed um, in an understanding of, of theodrama. It's the inclusion of other creatures requires the um, active participation of human beings. And this is where um, I'm going to become uh, maybe more radical still and suggest that the theodrama depends on not just other creatures acting, but also how we act. And for this particular idea, I take the inspiration of Romans 8, where we, uh, if you remember that, the, the, the text I'm referring to, it's about other creatures longing, waiting for seeing how human beings are going to act. And I would say that it's as if other creatures are, uh, are as it were, on the stage with us, but they are to some extent tied or uh, unable to, to move, as it were, unless we move in a particular way. And that's why there is this longing waiting for us to act. And that's why they are included in the theodrama. Of course, some creatures will have a greater sense of agency than others. I'm not suggesting that they are all passive. But I would say that our particular action and reaction is crucial to what's going to happen to other creaturely kinds. So the vocation of humanity is a responsible action on the world stage and not simply um, passive non-interference. It's an ethical mandate then in building a community of justice, which includes not just justice for human beings, but also justice for other creatures in the, on the earth who share our creaturely home. And peace amongst nations presupposes peace with creation. This isn't a novel idea. This came in the um, papal, uh, the world, the world letter, the, the letter of the to the. Can't get my words. <laughs> the World Day message of peace, um, both um, both for Pope Benedict the Sixteenth and for Pope John Paul the Second. So they both made the same sort of statement. So they. So what I'm saying is that I, this isn't any kind of heterodoxy. This is, as it were, at the heart of the Catholic tradition, that peace amongst nations presupposes peace with creation. So act justly, love tenderly, and walk humbly with the Lord. 
And that is, as it were, the manifesto for how humans are to act. We're having a number of manifestos at the moment in, due to the um, presidential election coming up. But what would happen if this was their manifesto? I wonder what would happen to their, their, um, their, their poll ratings. Act justly, love tenderly, and walk humbly with the Lord. So now some tentative conclusions. First of all, deep incarnation is connected to the word made flesh. It's grounded in the Gospel of John in that particular ta text that talks about logos, made flesh, and the, and the flesh becoming the prerequisite for glory. But it also um, is premised on a historical Hebraic approach of the word as deed. So just as um, the word made flesh resonates in a cosmology, so also if we see it through the word made deed, it also brings in a historical dimension, which is very important. Sophia is one way to unite the particular with the universal, but it carries with it the temptation for over-speculation. I don't say it has to do that, but there's always that temptation there. Deep inclination, on the other hand, implies an inc inclusive theodramatics, mediating between being in the world and our action. Theodrama, then, is the boundary between history and an ontolo ontological account of Christology. Theodrama is also inclusive, so it's ecological. So it has importance for ecology and how we think about what ecology means and its significance for our um, theological understanding of who Christ is. And this is my last um, slide. Theodrama is at the boundary of creation and new creation. A new creation includes the awareness of resurrection hope where the love of God is expansive, bold, dramatic, and dynamic. It involves the action of the Holy Spirit, and so, in this sense, points to the vocation of human beings. So it points to what human beings might become. So deep incarnation, as I understand it, is a challenge for us to act in the light of the common history of the earth in which we find ourselves, in the light of the future and somewhat fragile planet in which we find our creaturely home. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Celia. And I'm sure that there are some questions or, or comments from the audience. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much for a very thoughtful talk. Appreciate it. It seems to me that the link between human beings and other creatures is the weakest link that, in your talk in a certain manner of speaking because the evolutionary paradigm does not really address our links to my satisfaction. And I'd like to suggest a different way to look at humanity. The human form as the primordial form and the animal forms as having developed out of the human in and having proceeded farther along the road to specialization. So we are the ones who have been held back. And that's the theory of the, the idea of neoteny, the youthful form. So this to me would create a real bond with other creation if we're sort of the primordial, the plastic form and when Christ says, be as little children that enter the kingdom of his, the childlike form uh, compared to the other animals. So that just occurs to me you could do something with that. Okay. Um, thank you very much for a uh, very original suggestion. Um, I think that um, as someone who's been trained in, in science as well as in, in theology, um, I do uh, take on, as it were, the significance of what scientists are discovering as well as what theologians speculate about. Um, and while that is a, is a very original idea, 
um, for me, um, I, I look at the phylogenetic tree, tree, as it were, and I see our origins as rooted in the life of other creatures. But that's not, that's not to say that that means that we are superior over other creatures um, in, a, in a dominating sense. But we are different. And so our, we are actually um, more flexible compared to chimpanzees or other primates, for example, because uh, chimpanzees are, have evolved into a more specialist niche. So you're right to say that we are more flexible in that sense. But, and, and in one sense, our plasticity in evolutionary terms comes because we shouldn't think of ourselves just in terms of a bag of genes, as it were. We also develop and evolve through learning. And that capacity to learn and change and be transformed is, if you like, at the heart of, of, of why we're different from, from other creatures. And it's here which I think um, evolution is sometimes, it, it can be helpful because our role in the theodrama could go in completely different ways. Uh, far, so our role in, the, in relation to other creatures is far more significant for those other creatures than anything that they could do themselves. But that's not to say that that, that means that, that those other creatures are devalued. It's just that our power is, is, is infinitesimal compared to some of the compared to the, if you like, the, 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 the power that other, the creatures have in, in terms of controlling their own um, life histories. So I think we need to recognize that responsibility. And that's why I ended up with an ethical mandate. But this is a, a talk primarily about deep incarnation and Christ significance for ecology rather than human nature and other animals, which is what I'm working on at the moment. So if we'd had that talk, I would have done it in a very different kind of way. So maybe that's um, another lecture, um, but 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 I but I do think that that if we understand the dynamic interrelationships, ecological interrelationships in which we are situated, it helps us understand both the significance that we might have, but also how we are dependent on other creaturely kinds as well. If we cut off ourselves from those roots, as it were, we, we will find it's self-destructive that we cannot flourish without the flourishing of other creaturely kinds. And this is something that environmental biologists have known for, for many years, but it's something which I think theologians are, for all sorts of reasons, maybe surprising reasons, are sometimes reluctant to take on, on board. Could you say a little bit more about deep incarnation being more than um, Christ emerging. Okay. You said um, it's it's more than divine presence emerging. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. more than the accompanying of the divine. Yeah, could mm -hmm. you say a little bit more about that? Okay, um, what I was trying trying to do is to uh, throughout the to, uh, the talk today is is set up a, a meditation really on the word made flesh, um, and an, an understanding of that both in historical terms but also in, in cosmological terms as well. And if you see Christ as simply emerging um, in, the, in an evolutionary sense, of course there's one sense in which, he, which Christ has emerged in an evolutionary sense, and that's he is continuous, his humanity is continuous with, with our humanity. So in that sense, Christ is emergent in that he is born of a living human mother. But there's another sense in which Christ's coming is a dramatic um, uh, incarnation of the word made flesh in a way that you wouldn't necessarily have expected if you just looked at the trajectory of the evolutionary story. So rather than being a kind of, if you like, a walk, there's something dramatic happens. And it's rather like the, it's, it has a parallel with the dra drama of the resurrection. And I think there's a sense in which there's a gap in terms of science and we need to sort of face that. And just in other words, just as the resurrection is something that we cannot fully fathom because it's about a new creation body, a body that walks through walls, a body that is um, not immediately recognizable by the disciples and yet to some extent still continuous with the, with the body that Christ had on earth. That is a dramatic um, incident, as it were. So the, the, the drama of, uh, the, the theodrama of, the of deep incarnation is one that you wouldn't necessarily have expected. In other words, you wouldn't expect God, who is the Lord of all that is, to become mortal flesh. That is a, a massively radical claim. 
Now you can either say, well, I'm sorry, I just cannot believe that in the light of science. I'll just have to have an emergent divine. That becomes more um, reasonable, if you like. <laughs> but what I'm, what I'm suggesting is something unreasonable, but at the same time profound in that it's not denying the, the livingness of the ecological and the evolutionary story, but it's also saying that at this point in the divine, in the deep incarnation, we found something uh, profoundly shifting. Um, now, um, if someone was to, to come up to me and say, well, I prefer to think of Christ's divinity as emergent, um, I would probably say, okay, that's your op opinion. But my opinion is a, is a little bit different, but partly because I want us to have a much deeper sense of the possibility of, in, uh, of, uh, of transformation, of shifts which aren't necessarily um, what uh, Jürgen Moltmann calls future ans, but shifts that are adventus. In other words, it's about the future hope coming to us in history, here and now, in a way that's surprising. If we just see a kind of emergent, an emergent story that emerges from the, the past of history, then there, there, there seems little, very little room for surprise and little room for change. Um, I think there are, there, are, there are powerful narratives that tell us that story. The evolutionary narrative itself tells us that story. And it's very gripping for the human psyche to think of ourselves in that vein. But I think in theodrama, we have to, be, we have to take room for the surprise and the, the possibility that, that things are different now than they would have been otherwise. So something radically new came with the coming of Christ, which changed everything. And, and I don't, I, I'm not saying that we have to hold on to a literal uh, understanding of the virgin birth or anything uh, of that sort necessarily, although a virgin birth would make sense in that particular model. But the radical nature of the word made flesh, I think that exactly what that means, I think we, I, I would say that if we cut that out, then we, we weaken our our um, Christological understanding and it becomes something different from um, the kind of Christology that I'm arguing for today. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. I'd like to know what sort of prayer life would be consistent with this vision. In particular, what sorts of meanings of petitionary prayer and contemplative prayer would be applicable in this context? Okay, um, now that's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, I, think, um, I think it's about being sensitive to vocation. In other words, I would say that the Ignatius of Loyola, who was an inspiration for Hans Els von Balthasar, and is, is uh, um, also, I found inspirational myself, um, fits into this particular way of viewing the world. Because there it's about listening. It's about listening to the word of God and being responding in obedience to what that call is. Now that, that call may not be palatable and it may not seem reasonable, but it's one that's done in faith. Uh, so it's about trying to listen out to, to the vocation, as it were, for me or for you, in the particular context in which I find myself. Where am I going to act and how, must, how should I act, as it were, is the deepest question, the deepest call. And of course, uh, Ignatius of Loyola also um, put a high premium on Christ, Christ in all things. He didn't have, I would say, so, uh, so, such a sense of the, the, the theodramatics and the way that Balthasar has, but at the same time, uh, Balthasar situates his theodramatics between what he called the lyric existential approach or the life of prayer and the, the life of, of narrative. Um, so it is a narrative, but it's not a grand narrative. It's a situated narrative that's particularized by a prayerful sense of response. So, so I would say that if you, if you put it in the, in, the, um, sh in the starkest possible form, the prayer life is one that's modeled on Mary. Mary could have said no. That was the most dramatic event in the whole of the Christian history. The angel Gabriel says, you will conceive and bear a child. 
she said yes, what would have happened if she'd said no? The whole of history would have changed. That is the very human theodramatics in action. And I would say that is also the mo one of the models on which we could also see of ourselves, perhaps, if we don't like to see of ourselves as Imago Christi, perhaps we can see ourselves in some sense patterning the way or the manner in which Mary was able to respond to that particular very unusual request. I'm, I'm interested in uh, where uh, feminist theology might fit into this, this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, do you see a feminine side of God? Uh, and you know, I, I, what's rolling around in my head is centuries and centuries and centuries of dominion theology, you know, hold, hold dominion over the earth. Um, and you know the possible identification of, of that way of thinking as a dominant. I don't. I don't want to create false dichotomies here. But but uh, Sophia has been identified as the feminine as the mm -hmm. feminine side of God. Mm -hmm. You know, I see a dominion approach. I also see the approach of I'll I'll use the word nurture, nurturing creation. And uh, could you speak to how you uh, have understood uh, the position of Dominion theology, uh, and do you see uh, Sophia as, as as particularizing the feminine side of God? You know, maybe not in a literal sense, but in a metaphorical sense. Yeah, um, I think that another very interesting question. Thank you. Um, I think the, the interpretation of dominion as domination is deeply unsatisfactory, and I'm sure uh, that's not what you're implying has come out of this talk. I hope not, otherwise I've failed. Yeah. 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 Yes. No. I, um, I, uh, I'm nervous about the idea around stewardship, for example, because I think stewardship has this mentality of managerial um, relationship with the earth. What I, what I want to uh, try and foster instead is a sense of cr shared creaturely existence. And that shared creaturely existence comes from understanding Christ as deep incarnation, in other words, deep into the very fabric of material, fragile, uh, creaturely reality. So it's not just incarnate in terms of human, human incarnation, it's incarnate into the, into the earth as well, but not in the sense of spreading out, in it, but in the sense of the significance of Christ for, for all that is living. So, um, so I, I would say that my own understanding, to get back to the feminine side again, is that the language of wisdom or the language, language of Sophia as feminine is very, very important. One of the problems with theodramatics is you can lose some of that um, language of the feminine and of course um, the stereotypical way that Hans Urs von Balthasar dealt with the male and the female was deeply troubling in my view and it's been heavily criticized by Tina Beattie and a few other feminist theologians but I don't think we necessarily have to ditch Balthasar completely we can take what he did uh, extract as it were a thread which is the idea of theodramatics and make it more um, sensitive to, uh, to feminist issues. So it becomes then um, responsive as well as agency. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a responsiveness there, but also a sense of, sort of agency. And that agency isn't confined to the male in the way that he would have it. So in other words, his understanding of the male-female relationships is very much the, the male is the agent and the female is the passive recipient. Well, I don't buy that. Um, I think that men and women together are both called to be active agents in the theodrama. Both are called also to be active listeners, in to, to hear the word, as it were, and to respond to what that word is. So I, I would want to say that ecology 
um, goes beyond the, 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 what you might call the sexist divide, um, which is one of the reasons why I focused most of my working career on ecology rather than on feminist issues. It's not because I don't think feminism is important, but I think the deeper issue for me um, is the ecological one, because it's, on, it's, it's the one on which the whole of human life de depends, male and female alike. And unless we get um, insights into how to treat the natural world, we, you know, our own discussions around feminism and things are, are, are going to fall on, on deaf ears. So, so, and I also think that, um, to some extent, that it's, uh, feminism is a Western preoccupation. I'm not, saying, I'm not trying to belittle it, but I'm saying that if you look at different cu cultures in different parts of the world, the, their concern is more with ecology than with feminism. So, and it's usually the women that have the, the greatest burden of ecological uh, burdens to bear. So if we can start to solve the ecological problems, we'll also solve the feminist problems rather than the other way around. Traditionally, feminist authors have said, we have to solve the fem feminist issues first, and then we look to ecology. Well, I think it's the other way around. I think we should solve the ecological questions and then some of the burdens for women will start to lift um, and uh, and I would say that we need to listen to other women as well in other um, other communities in different parts of the world in the developing world in particular and I'll just give you an example of that I uh, had the privilege of um, spending a year on secondment with the CAFOD which is the Catholic Fund for Overseas Development between 2009 and 10 and one of, the, um, one of the things I was invited to do was to go out to Kenya and visit some of their projects. And one of the projects I visited was the, was the Maasai tribe, uh, which was a women's group, a women's collective. And I was deeply impressed with the power of the, of the woman who was speaking on behalf of all of them to speak for her community and to articulate herself in a way that was both responsive, um, responsible, and ecologically... Um, uh, intuitively uh, right, um, and and so so I'm so when I'm and that was done through um, uh, CAFOD actually bringing in a distillation device that allowed uh, volcanic water erupting uh, or steam coming from this volcanic um, issuing from the ground to be distilled in such a way that they then had fresh water. So suddenly their livestock, their families, their children, and so on, were healthier than they would have been otherwise. And this particular um, woman saw the visit of CAFOD as being um, the direct intervention of God. Uh, I mean, it was, a, it was like meeting someone from the New Testament. <laughs> you know, the, um, I, I would, I've written about it in a, in a book on relig religion and ecology in the public sphere. I've written the, the story, as it were, of this encounter. Now, whether or not you say, oh, well, this was a very naive faith or whatever, I, th I think that's, in a sense, beside the point. What was important was that she saw herself as part of a theodrama, only she wouldn't put those words on it. And we've got taped recordings of that um, interview with her. Um, you know, So it was written down, and we were faithful to what she actually said rather than trying to put words into her mouth, as it were. So we went there to listen, and we were astonished by both the solidarity of that group, um, but also um, this, this sense that she had that, that we were, as it were, sent there by God to uh, enable orphans to flourish where they hadn't flourished before. In other words, she was using scripture and interpreting it literally in their case. Um, and I found that really quite remarkable. Um, so maybe we've lost a little bit of what you might call childlike faith in seeing ourselves as part of this um, theodramatic enterprise. And maybe we need to listen to some of the most impoverished people in the world to teach us these kinds of lessons. How we think about time influences how we understand the unfolding of the drama. You know that, so your word accompanies, the divine presence accompanies creation. I think there were a lot of things you were doing that make it be becoming. It didn't just happen, even though there is a dramatic event, oh, yeah. but that dramatic event is 
happening for us, for these women in, in where you are, you know. And I just wonder how you, how do you see sometimes, and, and I will be honest, sometimes I think the church has a very, you know, limited historical sense of time. And so this, the bigness of time in this theodrama. Oh yeah, I, I don't want to think of theodrama as just being um, multiple, dramatic, unexpected, sudden events. It's also about the day-to-day -day and the, and the, if you like, the boring acts in the scene. <laughs> so there are some acts where nothing seems to happen for centuries or years or weeks or days. But there are certain other events which are fairly critical. So, so, and I do see a movement. In other words, I see the transformative movement of, towards the new creation, which is part of what I would call the eschatological key in which all theology, as it were, resonates, including deep incarnation. So deep incarnation has a movement. It's not simply a static relationship of Christ's coming and Christ's presence and Christ's significance for all that is. There's also a movement in theodrama because theodrama is historical because drama is about history. So it's a new way of thinking about history and it's one of the reasons why I prefer it to um, uh, creaturely and divine Sophia now. Because although I found that deeply um, attractive, for, uh, and although I'm still attracted to that idea of, of divine and creaturely Sophia, there isn't this movement, there isn't, the, if you like, this movement towards change in the way that you do get with theodramatics. Um, at the same time, I think we can see that theodrama as being inclusive of Sophia. So if we can sort of weave in our understanding of Sophia and make Sophia, as it were, one of the aspects of incarnation, so... Christ is Sophia incarnate and not simply Logos incarnate, then it starts to change that Sophia, creaturely Sophia, divine Sophia dialectic. It becomes part of the movement. Wisdom accompanies then the movement towards the kingdom in the way that I think that theodrama, theodrama leads us to. What I'm working on at the moment is looking specifically at the human, uh, human uh, person in relation to other animals. Um, and it's a theological anthropology, as it were, in the light of theodramatics, um, whereas what I was talking about today was more about Christology. But what I want to do after that is to look at, eventually, maybe 10 years or however long it takes, uh, is to look at pneumatology, because I think pneumatology is crucial in thinking about the human person and thinking about the, the future of creation. So, um, so but it, we have to take our each step one at a time and each step is tentative and exploratory and I'm not suggesting I have the last word on this I'm saying it is it is um, an exploration in theology and it's an exploration of ideas uh, it's not intended to be any, any sort of final word or any sort of rigid word it's intended to open up um, reflection open up uh, insight open up new ways of thinking about ourselves in relation to who we are in relation to God and so on. So I don't want to close off the conversation or have it as static. I want it to be moving, moving forward and maybe changing, improvising. I think the theodramatics is about improvisation. Now what's interesting is the, the combination of improvisation and direction in the, in the theodrama. What, what, what do we do with that? And I think that the guidelines are very, fairly general. Uh, just as Simon Conway Morris talks about convergence in the evolutionary story, convergence on certain forms in a way that he describes as uncanny, but also there's a lot of contingency there, and Stephen Jay Gould has stressed the contingency. So in theodrama, there's a similar pattern, this pattern of certain convergencies, but also a lot of contingency, a lot of unexpected events, but also ones which where you can see a movement, and we are not in the position of God. So we do not see where the, necessarily where the movement's leading us to. But, the, but we ha I think in faith we can accept that that movement is there. And that movement is part of the story in which we are un bound up ourselves. That was a very satisfying answer. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just wondering how, um, Celia, how you um, see God acting in the world. Um, I guess for Sophia, I, I would see 
her as the inspiration, the embedded presence that inspires us to, you know, that draws us. And, um, or in Teilhard's, you know, view of the cosmic Christ leading us forward. Um, you know, how, how does that happen? You know, how does God act um, here? I mean, I see that the, uh, the pattern, the, the life, death, and resurrection pattern is all over. I mean, it's in the natural world. It's, you know, it's, it's in my life. It's everywhere. But, but how is, is God moving us? I'm not sure that I heard that. Yeah, that's, um, that's another, another very profound and difficult question. <laughs> um, I, th I mean, I, my, my own view is that, 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 that God is the, is the creator of all that is, but also that God's presence is embedded in all that is as well. But it's God's presence with us rather than, or with the creation, rather than identified with, identical to creation. Um, and I think this, the, the question you ask is the question of, of pneumatology. Um, and so how we are led is a question of how we understand what the, the Trinity is and who the, who the Trinity is. And I think that we, we end up bumping up against mystery. Um, and so I, I don't have a fixed understanding of, of, um, of, who, uh, of who Christ is in terms of who to respond to. But I do know that we see traces, traces of that mystery in the creation. Um, and so those traces act as a, as a kind of pointer towards what God is, is like and where God might be leading us. But it's also about a listening, a listening to the scripture or text, um, a responsiveness to what you might call um, uh, Lectio Div uh, Divina, you know, the, the, the word of God. So it's about listening out for those flickerings of the presence of God. But I don't think it comes necessarily in, a, in it's not like um, an agent out there giving us clear instructions um, because I think the, the, the agency of God is very deeply buried and we, we are we, we struggle to understand what that might mean and we struggle to understand where that might lead but we have to take or we, we are called to take those steps in faith even though we do not see and so those steps in faith, even though we do not see, is after the pattern of Christ. So, so we have this pattern to follow, and we have these um, glimmerings, as it were, in the natural world. And we have our times of rest and inspiration when we go into the... I mean, for me, the, most, the, the, the presence of God is at its most intense um, in the natural world. Um, so if I want to feel inspired and refreshed... I go into the natural world, and that's where I, I find God. Not in a literal sense, but in the sense of a renewing sense of the presence of, of God. Uh, and so, um, so I think um, but it, different people have, have different kinds of perceptions. And I think the insight comes, using a long, longhand language, insight comes in knowing ourselves well enough to know where those flickerings of, of God will come to life. And so trying to understand ourselves and say, well, what is it that gives us that insight, that gives us that flickering sense of God? Is it reading the scripture? Is it going out into the natural world? Is it listening to music? Is it just being still and listening out for an inner voice within? And I think everybody is different, and maybe we have different times in our life when different things will be more meaningful. Um, but often it's when we are suffering and at our most weak, that's when, it's, if you like, the grace of God becomes more profound because it's a, a grace that is hidden. And, uh, and I think of, um, uh, you know, we've had discussions about um, the soul of human beings and whether there is such a thing as a soul or a mind. Or In other words, is the soul separate from the mind or is, is there something there that's different in human beings that there isn't in other other creatures and so on and I think that the the soul is able to tune in to to what God is saying in the way which is a privilege for the human for, for human beings um, because that kind of uh, religious experience isn't something that other animals can experience for all their um, creaturely beauty and power and wisdom and so on and natural wisdom 
that they don't have that um, instinct for being able to respond to, to the divine in the way that's been given as a burden and, a, and as a privilege to the human person. Um, and uh, and thinking about um, my own father is dying of uh, dementia and a stroke and all sorts of things, and and his mind has gone um, completely, and he doesn't recognize people. But there's something about him that's still there. His soul is still present. And I think that if we see it like that, so it doesn't have to be a, a mental exercise of contact with God. It's a kind of graced experience of awareness of who we are in relation to the God who calls. And it, so, it, so I think that theology is a reasoned reflection on some of those processes. But um, as with uh, Thomas Aquinas, we can say it's all but straw at the end of the day. But, you know, we... It's that sometimes the mystical experience of God that has so much more power in our lives than anything that theology might be able to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celia, for a very inspiring talk. I think uh, we've all really learned a lot, and uh, uh, I, I really appreciate the, your integration, you know, of the two, of the uh, of the science and the theology. And uh, I hope uh, all of you will return now for our next uh, it, 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 events, uh, November sixth. Is it fifth? No, November fifth is the next, and then uh, November twenty sixth. Be sure you sign up for. Our our mail. Okay. Have a safe trip home. Thank you.